Right, I'm here for another episode of Thor Inquiry, and my guest for this one is going to be a return guest. It's Quintus Curtius, who you might have heard on a past episode, but we ran a little short on time there, so we only kind of got the initial topics discussed. How are you doing at the moment, by the way, mate? Oh, doing just fine, Thor, and thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Cool. Right, one thing I thought we would do, we t- touched on some of these topics a little bit last time, is, but one thing I would like to do for the younger generation is just give them a flavor of what life was like in past decades, in past cultures, <laughs> past traditions. Because I'm not saying that to make us sound incredibly old, but I mean, I actually do feel sorry for the younger generation, mate, because even though every generation had its propaganda and its cultural myths and all these things, this generation has it worse than any of them, mate. Like they grew up and they're just in an astro turf bubble of corporate nonsense and yeah. literally getting told made up things were traditions that they were all, like, I mean, if anyone's done that famous Google search you can do on some of the terms that people have now in politics some of them were like never used on the entire internet like 10 years ago but now we have to pretend that stuff was here forever and we were always at war with east asia as it were so what i want to ask initially was this it might sound like an incredibly open-ended question but it's quite an earnest one mate right have you ever seen i'll give the setup have you ever seen that meme where it's like a classic sort of 1950s style image of the white picket fence family and it's the one where there's like an old man and there's like a, a like a an a, a husband a wife and a like a girl child and a boy child and they're just doing something like i don't know barbecue or something like the most typical americana you can imagine and what they do in the modern day with this meme format is they just insert like speech bubbles onto each person it's a super yeah. like shit lib meme you know what i'm talking about right where yeah, it's yeah. like you know the granddad's like i actually am suffering like trauma from world war ii and then the dad's like i'm secretly <laughs> gay but no one knows it and then the kid's like <laughs> oh i'll never get to have a job like i want you know it's like it's ex- it's like the neoliberal nightmare just right, right. put Onto right. what to me is actually just genuinely like just a beautiful scene of what we all wish life could be and what it maybe it was right along those lines you can see the setup of where i'm going here i actually feel like there's been a very successful propaganda war fought against the past here quintus it feels like they've actually yeah. convinced these kids that all of the problems and degeneracy and insecurities and anxieties that people are all the neuroses all these things that everyone just had them in all of history and they were just sort of keeping it down it, does that match with your life experience what would you say the past was like for you yeah it it does it, it very much does uh Lauren. and this is a question you know i've often kind of thought about asked myself asked other people interacted with you know even people older than i am and i'm i'm 54 so i guess i'm a gen x uh type so i grew up in the you know late 70s 80s 90s whatnot but uh you know the this is kind of the 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 i guess the final conclusion that i've i've come to um we've always had every era has always had its foibles uh stupidities follies uh, fooleries and uh, absurdities but with the speed of communications and the the rise of social media and and the instantaneous power of communication that we have now Everything has just been amplified. That really is the difference. I think, I think it's just the, whereas in, in previous eras, like say in the eighties, uh, you know, or, or even nineties, the stupidities had an inherent firewall. You could, you could block them out. They, they could only get so far. Uh, the, you know, the, the brainwashing, the, the, uh, the, the power of suggestion could only go so far, but now, it's been amplified to such an extent that you can't get away from it. It's everywhere and it's constant. And I think this is really what has corroded the power of judgment for, for people and really threatens, I think, in many ways, the, the meaning of education in, in, in some ways. So, um, yeah, different eras were different because people's consciousnesses, uh, people's sense of consciousness w- were shaped by different forces. And that really is the is the difference, I think, you know? You know, along these lines, I've got a funny sort of admission to make to you, which is because of the era I grew up in, in the 80s in England, you can imagine... 
probably the most, we would have said the most annoying nationality is easily Americans, mate. And the reason why was <laughs> all the cultural sensibilities just go against what, in theory, our Brit English cultural sensibilities are. So, you know, in England, for example, you're not supposed to sort of brag and show off that you're succeeding. You're supposed to actually sort of be a bit humble and pretend like, you know, oh, yeah, I don't deserve it really, you know, but I like guess I'm having a good year. Whereas obviously the American way is sort of like, I'm number one, I'm the best, like you hate us because you ain't. And here's what's funny, mate. Even though I, I, I naturally fell into that. It was sort of like, oh, they are a bit brash and over the top, aren't they? It's a bit grand, especially, obviously, everyone knows the classic one where you have an American guy who's never traveled the world, but they're telling everyone America has to be the best country in the world and it's better than everywhere else. And you're just thinking, what? Come on, bro, you haven't even tried anywhere else. But here's the admission I've got to tell you here, Quintus. I actually miss that now, mate. Do you know what's sad? <laughs> is when I look at America in particular, this is a country where whoever they are, they very successfully assassinated the cultural myth. Like in the modern yeah. day, anyone who is alive, with the kind of thinking I'm talking about is portrayed as at best like an ignorant fool and at, at worst just like some dangerous radical who needs to be like suppressed by the government or something crazy because to me I, I can't remember who said this but there's someone who said something on the lines of like no civilization can exist with a negative like cultural myth like that there has yeah. to be some foundation of like fu fundamentally we are good we stand for the right things and you know here's what we aspire to be right what do you say how, how have you seen the change of America that sense for you because it doesn't feel like it was that long ago mate since everyone was still doing the USA USA all the sports games and the flags now the joke I mean people will have seen recently you would think you're in a different country right yeah yeah well what you just said uh brings out a very important uh point I think uh Lauren and it's a very deep one and I think it's one that was touched on by um a Cambridge Don named Kenneth Clark in his his series uh, Civilization you may have heard of it, it oh it it's was mega a very, yeah oh yeah it's fantastic it's a very fantastic and he 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 said what you just said, but maybe in a different way. He he worded it as confidence. One of the essential requirements, I think, of the sustenance and nurturing of a civilization is its sense of confidence in itself. It has to believe in its own rectitude. It has to believe that it is good and that it is it is uh, uh, a, a force for for positivity in the world. And when you take away that confidence, when you crush the spirit of the nation, of the civilization, then you've got real problems. And I would absolutely agree with you. There, there has been a concerted effort, uh, I think, in the past 30 years to, to systematically try to dismantle the traditional pillars of American culture, and also in, in England, too. For I, I don't, I've visited your country twice now and enjoyed it both times. Uh, the the, the, the uh, English-speaking countries in some ways are under attack by this oh for sure this 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 uh this neo-liberalism neo-marxist philosophy of life where everything that we did was bad yep it's all it's all evil it's all based on uh whatever ism you choose to slap on it whether it's classism racism genderism sexism feminism whatever whatever uh evil du jour we decide to use and this is having a very very uh, corrosive and dangerous effect on the youth because if they're brainwashed into believing that they're bad, then how are they going to defend themselves yes. from internal or external attack? And this is this is very very dangerous. But but it, it's pushed. This stuff is pushed by the powers that be because it helps them maximize their wealth. It helps them sell more things. It helps them turn you into the perfect consumer. So this is why we have to really fight this trend because it's uh, it's a matter of survival at this point. Yes. I mean, along these lines, one cultural area I can really see this in is actually what they've done to things like um, – popular entertainment for children. Because when I was a boy, one thing that was really cool was when I would go to some of my older relatives, they would just keep the bedroom of whatever, my uncles or whatever, the same way that basically, like it was like a museum. It's like whatever day that guy left two decades earlier, yeah. the room was the same. But as a kid, what was amazing was when I went in there, they would have like books and comic books from when they were a boy, like 20 or 30 years before me. And when I yeah. would see these comics, I remember thinking like, wow, what the hell? Like, because almost none of them obviously were superheroes. That wasn't really a big thing in England back then. It, all their comics they read, mate, were like 
be a, being like a navy guy on the oceans yeah. or pirates oh, and adventure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or being a soldier and you're the hero in a battle that's going to fight through some of enemy lines, or you're a spy and you're trying to gain some information, or you're yeah. a detective and you solve. These are super oh, aspirational sort of like <laughs> things. If you're a kid, though, like if you're a kid, you vibe with this straight away. Like that's exactly the perfect plot for you. Whereas if I look at that now, they they have turned it into some sort of consumerist nightmare, and that and really a lot of those things are actually portrayed as negatives now. If you look now, almost everything's postmodern. Right? Everything's sort of corrupt. There are no ideals, it feels like. Yeah, I know, man. It's, it's uh, you're exactly right. I mean, the you know, in the old days, it was, uh, there was a concerted, and you, if you look at the, the books uh, and the, the, like you said, the, the pulp novels of the early 20th century uh, in both U.S. and uh, England, they were very uh, nationally minded. Yep, it was, it was about teaching. The teaching, the uh, I mean, I, I you know, I have a, a very wonderful series that I learned that I was required to read as a kid. And they were published, I think, in the '60s. It was a it was a British series. I forget what it was called, but it was all about the the, the Greek and Roman myths and uh, condensed, you know, summarized versions of the um, of the English classics. You know, uh, Daniel Defoe, Charles Dickens. All right. All the and and you know, it was a, it's a, it's a, those things really have an impression on you as a as a young boy and and now uh, and it it it, it inculcates in, in a student a, a respect for his heritage for his uh for his past uh i think for humanity in general but now it's just been replaced by this just utter nothingness uh i i don't even know what to call it it's just this sort of empty uh, uh feel goodism hand holding <laughs> yes. uh insipid nonsense and uh, I, 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 it's the question we're all trying to deal with, man. We're all trying to, we're all trying to to deal with it. How is this? Is this a permanent feature now of the, of the world we live in, or is this just a strange anomaly that's going to come to, uh, come to its own end out of its own uh, internal contradictions? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. But we we ha- we can't just throw in the towel and we can't just say, um, well, you know. Uh, that's just the way it is, and we're gonna because then then they're gonna go after the libraries. They're gonna yes. go after they're gonna go after the museums, the libraries. I mean, it's we're it, it, it's a it's a real fight now uh, for the soul of of Western man. I think. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's funny that of all the big dystopia novels, everyone knows Brave New World, 1984. It's funny when I see those stories where they're like rewriting old books and they're changing it on your Kindle without you even noticing. And, you know, in the future, if you don't have the original hard copy, like the, the, essentially that your version of the book will be the one that's wrong. No one will know what you're talking about. Dude, I almost feel like it's like some Fahrenheit 475 or whatever the fuck that one from Bradbury was, where eventually <laughs> people just had to be like a living record of the book themselves because there was no way you're the information remained like it almost feels like that's culturally something that's happening as they start molding these things around everyone yeah no i agree i agree thor and you know one of my favorite uh dystopian futuristic novels uh is by one of my favorite uh victorian era writers hg uh, wells your your very own hg okay. wells who who uh, uh, he you know he's he's in many ways he's sort of fallen out of favor sure uh, in the modern world but i think he really uh, he had a big influence on me as a kid, just his science. His, well, in those days, they were called scientific romances. And just the way they wrote back then is just so exquisite. You know, the the way these old Victorian British writers used to write. I just I just would just I still love it. But anyway, he wrote a very good novel called When the Sleeper Wakes. Okay. And in, in many ways, if you ever have a chance, you might want to check this book out because it, it it's it's a it's a startling and very unsettling vision of the future, uh, which is a mix. It, it's not, it's very different from 1984's. Uh, it, it's, it's a strange mixture of chaos and authoritarianism. Um, and I think to me, it, it has the ring of truth in many ways that some of the other novels don't, but you might, you might want to check that one out when you get a chance, because I, I found it to be very, a lot of insights in, in that book. Oh, nice one. Yeah. I'll, I'll put that down. So, right. 
Here's a question. If you I get a chance. No, it's good. You get a chance. Something I always appreciate recommendations when they're legit. My problem is that when people do that thing where they just recommend what's their guilty pleasure without knowing it's their guilty pleasure, you know. As long as someone's <laughs> earnest and they actually, you know, they get the sense of the awful app. Right. Here's a question I have for you. So yeah. in general, people have been able, I've noticed, in their own little atomized areas of culture to identify things like, oh, there's sort of like an attack on masculinity, but they don't ever ask themselves questions like, but to what ends would that be? Or what would the effect of that be? So what one thing I actually want to ask you about is, in general, I actually do notice that a lot of the ways that men seem to, I mean, I know the term naturally is quite a loaded one, but you go with me on this one. The way that men naturally seem to organize into hierarchies and how groups form and who's repelled from the group and who gets to be accepted, etc. One thing I've noticed is almost completely banned across society from verbally doing it to literally doing it to having any sort of mechanism is any kind of male hazing. So I want to ask, as someone who was actually in the Marines at one point in time and has been through some of the more strict hierarchies, at least in the past in your country, when I was a boy, I looked at this, and I can't lie, like I, can't, I, was, I was raised in the gynocentric world too, mate, of like, be nice to people and oh, don't be mean to the kid who's weird or whatever, and all that <laughs> goff. So I, can, I can't lie, whenever I saw this stuff, I did just think, oh, it's just bullying, isn't it? Yeah, fuck the guy who's doing that. Like, to, But I have to say, in a fucked up way, I sort of see the almost so, social function of it now. Like I get the vibe from my own experience. There is a kind of man that only really learns when they're sort of, I mean, it can be a bit harsh, but set straight as it were, sort of just shown literally like these are the boundaries. This is what people won't stand for. Here's what you've got to do to sort of be accepted. What would you say on this topic? Because I know it's quite, it's one that from the outside can seem very harsh, but it does seem like there's got to be a reason this endured throughout male relationships for so many thousands of years, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, and I, I I think I think you're I think you're absolutely right. Look, uh, I think you said it very well uh, that uh, traditional masculinity uh, thrives on hierarchical structures, uh, rules, uh, rules based uh, organizations, um, understanding and respect for the martial virtues, for um, you know, for uh, you know, honor, pride. Traditional concepts that are, in many ways, deeply threatening to the modern consumerist ethic. And so for this reason, this is one of the institutional reasons why the modern consumerist ethic is trying to uh, relegate masculinity to the, the, the ash bin, to the dust heap, uh, because it, it's, a, it's a threat to, to, um, to expanded governmental and corporate control of the modern consciousness. And I think you're right. I think that these uh, these uh, traditional masculine uh, type institutions, like the military or clubs or uh, fraternities or um, you know a- any any of these traditional masculine spaces, they had their own rules and their their own initiation rituals, and these served a very important function. And um, you know, obviously, nobody is saying that 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 people should be you know you know, abused or killed or, but there, there definitely needs to be some sort of initiation. There needs to be there. You have, you should have to pay for your entry. Yes. Into, you, you should have, there, there needs to be a price of admission if you want to be part of the club. Otherwise it becomes meaningless. You know, yes. you, you can't, I mean, men, this is how, uh, this is just how men as, 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 as uh, primates and organisms relate to each other. There needs to be, an understanding of hierarchies and there needs to be uh, trust built amongst the different members. And how can you trust anyone if they have not been through a similar experience? Yes. You can't. And, and simply you're right that there, there are many corrective measures that need to be taken to socialize uh, new initiates into these uh, clubs. And this is not, this is nothing new. I mean, in the ancient world and the medieval world, you had guilds, you had uh, religious orders, you had military orders, knights, you had, uh, in the ancient world, you had uh, philosophical schools. Yes. You had, you had Pythagoreans, you had Epicureans, you had Stoics, you had uh, mystery religions, which were very cult-like and they were very uh, rules-based. All of these things now are, are frowned on as somehow uh, uh, evil and oppressive when they have a very, very long uh, tradition uh, throughout the world in every society. And uh, this is, I think, is what uh, needs to be kept alive. Yes. Along these lines as well, I think another 
aspect of how here's one thing that I almost see this as like this was like a sleeper idea planted in society and it's only now that it's sort of come to bloom that you see the horror that was there all along which is I used to when I grew up again you're right actually by the way there's a lot of mirroring between the UK and the USA and it has a similar decline and you can almost look at the things and it's just one's got a different flavour because it that suits the British yeah. sensibility one has one for the American one but the end goals are the same clearly when you look back in the past I also do look at these societies and I see an element whereby to me the hidden the hidden like uh, weed was egalitarianism because when I was young I, this I didn't know this but essentially I this was just my operating system I thought the best thing you could do was just be fair to everyone I didn't realize what a loaded term fair was that someone else was setting my meaning of what fair was and so I really did think no you shouldn't believe in any categories you should believe everyone is capable of everything they should all be given a chance and what I realized is like that's just not any logistic way to run anything like you wouldn't just say oh I need my um, plumbing fixing like oh you random guy on the street yeah you give it a go mate you could probably do You'd make sure you found someone who's a specialist. You know, you would go and you would seek someone out with certain qualifications. But in society in general, we've been told not to do that. And the reason why I bring this up is because I think the most insidious part of it is they always sold you it along the lines of what sounds great. It sounds like sort of a higher ideal of philosophy, right? The idea that everyone should have the right to think what they wish and to be able to express their right. thoughts. And we should be allowed a forum in which we can do this. But I've noticed they've sort of like taken that concept and blurred the lines. And it's Essentially, it's just to trick you and me into letting anyone do anything they want. And then essentially, by the time it's too late and you go, whoa, this is about control, they go like, hey, whoa, 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 you're a bit intolerant, aren't you? And it's like tolerance was just like the the sort of smoke screen to get all these things yeah. under the wire, as it was. Whereas now, I have to say, even though I used to view this concept very negatively, I now see how important gatekeeping is, mate. Like, actually, if I look back now, I wish I could have gone back and gatekept certain people out of my communities or my fucking circles or certain areas of my job. I should have been a lot more ruthless, you know. What would you say to this topic? Because it's just oh, yeah. something I've been thinking about myself recently. Oh, yeah. Well, it's 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 very interesting, isn't it? And I, I, think, it, what it, I think what you're referring to is that you're highlighting the distinction between uh, equal treatment under the law and and uh, uh, actually treatment in in practice based on uh, meritocracies. I don't, I don't think anyone would argue that uh, you know, in a theoretical sense, everyone should be treated equally under the law. When in terms of, of uh, the law should be applied dispassionately to each person, but that does not mean that. Certain systems don't depend on meritocracy. Uh, there's a difference. There's a difference between a theoretical treatment under the law and, you know, the, the functioning of certain systems that depend on knowledge and experience and competence. And you can't just have a, an idle dunce uh, in charge of a system that depends on merit or competence or presence of mind. And this is what we've done. We've, like you, like you, you said, we've confused, we've conflated these two things to our severe detriment where you have, uh, uh, complete dunces, in many cases, malicious dunces, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, put in charge of, of institutions and organizations, uh, where merit is, is paramount, not, uh, not just someone's um you know gender or background or sex or race or whatever you, you've got to have a certain level of uh, of proficiency and um i think i think this great leveling that we've experienced with the advent of modern technology has really eroded the concept of of, of proficiency and and expertise every uh again you know the new technology has been good in some ways there have been some positives that it has sort of opened up the field to people that may have been shut out in, in the past. But on the other hand, now every every insolent dunce believes that he has a voice. And uh, as we all know, that is uh, not the case. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> every, every, every impertinent clown believes himself uh, competent to speak on the, the um, you know, the workings of, um, of the timepiece when he should be just watching the hands move. Instead of instead of seeking to, to to repair it. By the way, this will sound like the ultimate boomer question, but I'll ask it anyway because I'm just a very earnest and curious person. So here's the question, 
right? One thing that I do see, and people, this might sound so dodgy when I say it like this, but there's no other way. This is just the way I experienced it in my life, mate. When I grew up and I lived in quite a poor town in the northeast of England, if I was a 12-year-old kid and I went out, me, two or three of my friends, I would never do this, mate. But if, I mean, I was just raised better. But if I had ever gone out on our BMX bikes, you know, and I saw some guy who's like 40, obviously has a job, probably a family, and he was walking home from the pub or the shop or something. If I went up and was rude to that person, not only one, might he just, in my, we used to say, give a clip around the ear, might just punch you in the head. But also, <laughs> he might just go and tell your parents, you might just be fucked up when you get home or the next day or at church or whatever. It wouldn't even have crossed my mind to do that. But in the modern modern day, if I go like 10 years forwards each time, that exact kind of scenario not only increases in frequency, but in the modern day, there's no world where the guy can give the person the clip around the ear. If they went and said something, I don't think the parents would give a fuck anymore. That's an area where I have interest in my own lifetime seen like a degradation. Like essentially, this even interjects into my world of as a career where on the internet, I am someone who publishes content and has to interact to some degree with fans. The fan of yesteryear might have said something idle or stupid, like, oh, what about this? And you just think, oh, whatever, just an idiot, isn't it? Nowadays, there's almost like, it's like that punk ethos is just all young people now, mate. They just have a whole thing of like, fuck anyone older. Everything from the past was shit. Everything now is the best. Like, you're all idiots. Like, lol, what is blood talking? All that, like, stupid thing where they all spam the same terminology. Have you, have you observed something similar yourself? Is there a way, because essentially what I've tried to highlight there is there was a physical, quite very real painful correction that would happen if you attempted something like that. Does it seem like that can exist anymore? If anything, the number one thing that is forbidden now is, not, without it making a bigger social issue, no individual is allowed to dispense any kind of justice themselves, right? That's somewhat yeah. part of the bigger issue with the whole guns thing in America at the moment, right? Yeah, no, it's true. I have noticed that. In fact, I... Well, you and I are both active on Twitter, and you you do see it all the time. I mean, we, you know, it, it's a problem. It's definitely a problem, Lauren. And you know, I go back and forth about it uh, because you know, there's there's two sides to to I guess my thinking about this. On the one hand, you know, you as an older guy, you want to you want to give these younger guys the benefit of the doubt and you want to say well they just don't know any better they've never been sure. trained they've never been taught they don't know any better um and they're they're, they're secretly crying for help or they're they they yes. may they may they may sound insolent and 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 rude but they're just that's just their way and you got to kind of reach out to them that's one side but then on the other side some of them really are punks like you said some of them, <laughs> yes. some of them some of them do need to get, uh, as as they used to say, cuffed about the ears, as maybe uh, yes. they, they as maybe Dickens would, would have said. Some of them need a good cuffing about the ears, and um, in the old days, that function was accomplished, like you said, by a, a a mother or father or uncle or an older brother. But now you can't even look at somebody the wrong way without some <laughs> yeah. social worker visiting you or accusing you of being a, a you know a, a accusing you of being an assaulter so it's it's a it's a delicate it's a, you know again it's it's another one of these issues that you have to kind of try to navigate around delicately you have to use it i've tried to, my way of solving it my way of sort of threading the needle so to speak is but i've tried to mix in i've tried to use a mix of carrot and stick maybe i've tried to uh try to i've tried to be the the sort of genial older brother maybe type of demeanor and every, but every now and then just um you know pick up the blackjack and start swinging and okay. um and i think maybe this this mix is is the best solution that i can think of but you're right there is some there there does seem to be a level of lack of well it, the lack of respect for tradition and authority uh, goes even even with those young guys who claim to be proponents of traditionalism in the past, and you know they want to they want to post a bunch of Greek statues and sure. you know let's yeah let's revive the past. Then 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 if you tell them anything, then all of a sudden you're just oh you're just a uh, you know you're out of date. That's old fashioned. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's like you want to say hey you know. The world will teach you, man. You know, you may think you know it all now. You may think you have all the answers, you know, but you're going to find out. And with those guys, you have to just let them 
let them go their way. You know, you can only you can only say so much, Thorin. You can only you can only say so much. And I, I like to think that if you just get enough of this information out there in between their ears, eventually they will see the light. Like it, it may the the the, real is, the 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 light bulb may not be turned on for a few more years, but they will eventually realize right uh, the truth of what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, this to me is why I get the vibe when you we, when people were younger, they were sort of told like, no, this is the job of a young man. Like go out there and find adventure, like go to another country, do some job, take on some responsibility. Because if you do that, like you're saying, like life will just start teaching you immediately. And if you're oh, a slow yeah. learner, you'll, you'll just have a very bad experience. But because <laughs> like, I have to say the weirdest thing about being young is the irrational self-confidence that people have when they are a teenager slash becoming adult, because Every decade after that, even if you get really good at something, you have a natural confidence that, you know, I know what I'm doing. I've got, I agree with you. It's more like the more I go through life, the more amazing I realize it, the learning, learning never ends. It just gets more and more and more. It's actually, it's quite a thrilling concept sometimes. That's right. No, you never, you never stop learning. And, you know, I'm, like I said, I, I still feel like I learn something new every day. And, and even when you think you've got a grip on it, then the rules change and you have to relearn something else. So it's you just you know you have to just condition your mind to be receptive to new ideas and you, you have to hope that your mind does not become so ossified and so set in its ways that you close out your mind and i see that with a lot of older guys they they don't they don't want to hear they don't want to keep abreast of current developments and i think we all have to do that now we just have to sure well you know it's, but um what the hell man you know <laughs> <laughs> so gotta do the best you can right if anyone follows your twitter or has seen or your blog updates over the years they will know you're a big cinephile you're a big into film and cinema oh, yeah. over the years so i picked out a few that i saw that was some interesting overlap with i wanted to just talk with you about some of these movies so sure. one that i actually only just saw recently even though it came out like a year ago or whatever was that movie the northman the one where it's sort of like a Oh, yeah. Viking-esque character who goes on a journey. And what I'll do is, in general, I'll try not to do spoilers, but I'll just talk around it. So basically, one yeah. thing I would say I want to ask you about with this movie was, I was shocked how sort of, it seemed like it had very mixed re response from a lot of people. Some people just seemed to ignore it or do the usual thing where they just decide it's terrible for a bunch of social reasons or whatever yeah. that thing where people do that grift. I actually thought this movie, I don't even know if I'd describe it as a great movie. Like I don't even know if I'll ever watch it again, but I thought it was incredibly compelling. And the thing I thought was very cool that I wanted yeah. to talk to you about was one of the things I found really awesome about it was it didn't try and do what all the modern Netflix movies do, which is it wasn't a movie about the past, but still use it as an excuse to crowbar a bunch of modern, like liberal philosophy into your head. Like this, felt like the joke was if it wasn't for the fact movie technology didn't exist you could almost believe this was just a story from thousands of years ago in like the in this particular period because it seemed like it had its own morality its own way of thinking its own worldview that it, and it never seemed to attempt to sort of appeal to the modern view it seemed to just sort of be like if you want to come into this world you just got to accept that it, it just yeah. is the way it is here right yeah yeah no i like I, I enjoyed that movie, and I, I want to make sure we're talking. That was the one. It, it was kind of almost like a Shakespearean. Yes. It, almost it was a, sort of like a Hamlet, yes. It, it had, yeah. No, I, I found that a very compelling movie because it, it transported you into that world. That was done by the same director that did. I, I very much admired his first movie, which was called The Witch. Oh, yes, and, yes. Uh, which was, which you know, was set in my neck of the woods in New England in uh, colonial Massachusetts, and I thought that was a wonderful a period piece and he which was made with a great deal of of meticulous attention to detail which i respect his name is e eckle eckle ex eccleston i can't so remember robert eggers name. or something i think eggers is. that's right yeah. yes that was there yeah there was the word egg in there somewhere <laughs> uh, he no i thought the movie was was very it had a nice mixture of realism and sort of surreal uh, you know mythical qualities uh, at the end and uh i i felt like like, like you said i felt uh, it that it transported me into this very um harsh and unforgiving scandinavian world of uh you know a thousand years ago and i i, I just found it a great movie experience um and i yeah, i think the problem is you know, people try to i think a lot of these critics they try to read too much into these re read too much into movies or uh, if they feel uncomfortable they try to condemn them for some reason instead of just taking it 
at face value is this look this is just a, uh, a director's attempt to to be thorough and to to give you a realistic experience i mean they 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 have to they have to politicize everything they can't just take it for what it's you know it, take it as it is and just judge it on its own merits everything has to be projected some sort of political statement or commentary on it you know Yes. I mean, along those lines, another reason I thought you might be interested in that movie, and I obviously saw you, you mentioned it on your blog, was that, to me, another thing, like, for example, about the Greek and the Roman classics that I find make things like the Iliad so interesting to read is... If you try to do that sort of postmodern deconstruction of what they're talking about and what, you know, who is p correct morally here, I think you're just going to get completely lost. The cool thing to me is the fact that they are sort of a time capsule. Like you can essentially just, without asking these questions of the day, you can just experience through a certain character, their morality, their work, seeing the world. And actually in doing so, what I find it's quite vital within these works is there is something there beyond what we think is right and wrong now. And we think we've got it all figured out. And in some ways we haven't. There are certain mysteries that they were dealt delving into even back then that have massive potency. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I think, I think absolutely right. I, you know, I think these old classics, these old uh, uh, epics and uh, lays and stories and uh, bard, uh, ballads, bards, uh, you know, I, I think these were, these were re repositories of, of psychological and moral truths that were far more sophisticated than, than we moderns like to give them credit for. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, that's, that's, you know, that's what I thought. And I, I think the movie reflected that, you know, there was a real understanding of the nature of power there and, and revenge and, um, you know, how to methodically go about handling yourself in, in, in a situation where you really had no control over things. So, yeah, I, I think, I think, um, I, I hope that director does, more more historical epics like that i i i think he's i think that's his thing that's his uh that's his forte a film I know you have a great deal of affection for. And I, I think it's really good too, but I have a friend where he, this is one of his biggest complaints ever in Cinema Dude, which is he says, not only does he think this first movie is mega, but apparently there's like 20 books in this series and they only did the first one. So I'm of course talking about the inimitable Master and Commander, Far oh, yeah. Side of the World. Give me some thoughts on this movie. If no one's, oh, if someone hadn't seen it before, how do you sell this movie to him? Because I think this is a bag of this one, mate. Oh, it's a fantastic, you know, I, I actually saw the, I actually was lucky enough to see the the, the original ship that, that was. Uh, oh, really? On, okay. On, on, on which that was filmed, it was moored. This was about. Oh gosh, this was. Uh, it was moored in um, somewhere in I think San Diego Harbor. Uh, this is back in I think 2016. I happened to see it. Oh, okay. I didn't go. I didn't go aboard the ship, but I I like walked on the pier, like walked walked by it, and it, it was just a. Beautiful vessel, but in any case, what I what I really liked about that movie was uh, number one, just the the fidelity to the naval life of a um, you know of a uh, you know uh, the, the British Navy at that time, just the real attention to detail, you know the the way the commands were called out, the, the scramble to general quarters, the uh, the the living in. Um, living under the constant threat of powder and shot and yeah. i just I, I i just felt the and also i think it was it, it just embodied such a very very uh admirable leadership quality in that in, in that uh commander is, is portrayed by russell crowe um because we just get so few examples of good leadership these days it's it's nice yes. and it's refreshing to see to see the virtues of a commander who sort of combined this kindly in some ways, a fatherly quality, also with a very stern and strict ethic of, of fairness and and um, and uh, and uh, aggressiveness, really, as a as a commander. So, I just uh, you know, I never read the book. My father read the entire series. I mean, in fact, he I have the he, he sent me uh, you know my my father bless his soul. He's he's an old gentleman now, but and he he spends a lot of time reading. He he sent me the full series after he read oh, wow. them. All. He, he he loved them. I haven't read them. I've heard everyone's into it raves about it. Like I said, I've just never tried it myself. I, I should do it. The movie looked great. Yeah, I, I probably should do. I, I I love uh, you know naval history and um, but I just I just it it was nice to see uh, a director really 
do justice to the to that world, to that ethic, and and to the the relationships between the characters. Because I, I really do believe that that I think embodies the the very best of the um, uh, of the British naval tradition, frankly. And I, I think that's a tradition that we as Americans are, were direct inheritors for. I mean, not many like to admit it or want to talk about it, but we we we're we're a product. The American Navy is basically a, a, a direct product of the British Navy, and, and uh, I think it's a tradition we can be very proud of. Um, and this this movie really, I mean, frankly, made me want to leap aboard the masthead <laughs> yes. and, and, and and climb up. Climb. It made me want to just pick up a, a you know a, a flintlock and a dirk and just take to the masthead. You know, it was great. It was it was fantastic. You know. You know, along the lines of what I said earlier about like the concept of like the way you're accepted or not by male groups, this movie also contains an amazing portrayal of this. If you remember, there's that character in it who's sort of the wimpy character who no one likes and they all think he's like a jinx and that he's going to cause like the ship to sink or something, you know, and he's just useless at everything. He's exactly the sort of person that like, I can see why women see a character like that and they just have the mothering instinct. It's like, oh, leave him alone, you know, give him a chance, guys. And it's like, if you're in a scenario, any kind of a war related scenario and i can tell you this from even even just from my job mate where i work in competitive video games and even though it's just a video game this is like you win or you lose there's massive stakes here and i can tell you when people get a reputation mate as either they're a bit wimpy or they fold under pressure or they can't be relied upon that is there's a natural male repulsion to that and i can see where it comes from because in these days when it really was life or death you can't look down the line and see a guy you can't trust all start crying and give up the ghost and all just yeah. oh what the like in a fucked up way you have to get sort of get rid of those people before you're in the life or death situation as, as I, I when i was a kid again i would have seen this movie so differently but i, I there's there is just a harsh reality about that to be in a man i think yeah yeah that's that's absolutely correct and i think it's it's something it's a lesson that we're going to painfully have to relearn. <laughs> yes we're going to have to painfully you know guys like us can talk about it and preach about it and write about it but the problem is if it's not practiced and not valued and look there we're never going to see the end of war uh the, another big one is probably going to come soon and uh, we're going to have to painfully relearn lessons that were learned and, and you know, uh, given to us for centuries past that we've forgotten or deliberately neglected. And, yeah, that, that movie has, has plenty of and there's just there, there's uh, so many examples of that. This 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 ethic of selfless uh, sacrifice. Uh, and I, I really do believe, Thorin, that most the vast, vast majority of men will rise to the occasion uh, to the best of their ability when when called upon okay but the, the problem is they're just never challenged yes. uh, today they're not they're not given the opportunity there are very very few true malingerers true um uh, true anti so th those types do exist they are out there and and th th that cannot be uh, corrected and and need to be dealt with with a very and believe me in the british navy they knew how to deal with them believe me as you know, and I know, uh, they, I mean, they, they, they did exist and, and they were dealt with in, in, a, in ways that are today considered uh, maybe barbaric. But in, at that, in that era were frankly necessary um, uh, because and this spirit of sacrifice also not extends not just to, to correcting those who needed to be corrected. But there were there were you remember there was a scene there where a, a man, uh, you know, I think takes a few cannonballs in his arms and leaped overboard when he w felt he was a burden to the, to yes. the group. Uh, I mean, again, it, it, it's uh, to the modern viewer that might seem, might, that might seem to be horrific, but things like that really did happen. And that, that's not an exaggeration. I mean, there were, you, you may even remember there was a British party of explorers. I forget if it was the North or South pole, but there was one man who just who realized he was a, he was a, uh, a drag maybe on the survival of the group. Oh, Captain Oates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he said, uh, "I'm going out, gentlemen." Yep. Uh, and to me, this this frankly embodies the very best of the of of the British ethic uh, uh, under fire. You know, I'm I'm going out, and I may not be back for some time. Yes. And yes. everyone knew everyone knew what was what he what he meant by that. Yes. And uh, I think that that's just the the most sublime type of heroism 
that that you can imagine and still exists. It, we, we haven't lost it yet, but but the problem is we just most men don't have a way of expressing it. Uh, it's we we have not yet had opportunity, but we will get our chance. Uh, to believe me, uh, because uh, these things, uh, conflict never challenges never end. They um, they they continue, and and we're going to see something happen soon. I think. Yes. Another movie, and oh, it's a classic, is obviously going to be The Deer Hunter. And I would just say this. When I was young, I remember this was one of those movies in the list of classics that I got to. And when I first watched it, I was like, man, alive, this movie is so long. It's taken so long. to." See. And I think, essentially, I, my mistake was I was trying to watch it like a normal movie with like a plot, and I'm trying to like progress the character. And what I realized now, I've never been in the military, so I'd love to get your take on it, is it seems like an incredible portrayal of how events that happen in war could be so incredibly almost searing into the mind and the soul all that you could never yeah. forget them like it's the first movie that may have ever made me understand why people could come back from war and i've had this happen with people i knew like a firework would go off and they would for real dive under the table like suddenly they were just back there it was like they, their brain was just back in some sort of other place other world other thing and then yeah maybe they snapped out of it in a minute or two but i remember thinking like what could have happened to the guy that movie sort of gave me a sense of like holy shit if it was something like that i get it almost what would your take be yeah well yeah you know the deer hunter is a very interesting, interesting uh, e example of, of what what you've talked about there. Uh, it came out in the late seventies, I believe it was seventy eight or seventy nine. I think it was seventy eight, and it was. It's generally considered one of the first, maybe maybe the first movies uh, that Hollywood uh, dealt with that seriously addressed the Vietnam War. And it was directed by Michael Cimino, who has a mixed record. I think is a, a filmmaker, but. Uh, this movie, uh, it's it's a very interesting example of of uh, of soap opera type drama, uh, relationships between friends uh, mixed with uh, you know scenes of of uh, of combat and um, you know captivity that that have just frankly never been really equaled oh. in, in their in their emotional power. The and yeah. you were referring to the the roulette scene there. Yep. <laughs> Uh, which no one, no one once having seen it can ever forget it. But uh, it, it seems, you know, I, I saw it again recently, probably about three months ago, and um, I think one of the one of the neglected themes of the movie is just the power of friendship. And you're right, it, it is it is unfocused in many ways. The opening wedding scene, I think, goes on too long. Uh, it can seem like some of these um, re the relationships uh, seem to, seem to um, take a lot longer on screen than they really should. But the I think the I think what the movie is trying to do is to present us with um, examples of how the power of male friendship can persist through the years and can overcome many obstacles, but maybe not all obstacles, because like you said the the, the uh, Christopher Walken character was so scarred by his experience and frankly so so uh, destroyed mentally that he just simply could not get out of uh, uh, what he had experienced. But um, I, I think I think for those reasons alone, the movie is still holds up well in the modern era. It still holds up well in 2023, and I would still recommend it because it it, it transcends the themes of war and suffering to really be about friendship and the connections between men and how those relationships can um, can be tried and tested and never you know uh, never quite resolved I mean there's there's a, one of the best scenes in that movie that I think really deserves a lot of discussion is you know the you remember the, the hunting scene where um, the Robert De Niro character is, is uh, he doesn't let uh, this guy Stanley use his boots he's like look I told yes. you when we come up here, I've told you before, you know, stop fucking this up. You know, life, life is, life is not a, life is not a fucking joke. Life is not a bloody joke. You better get your ass together. You better, make, you better get your shit together. Uh, and when he said that, he, you know, this, this really was a very telling scene because it exposed the divide between these two men. You know, they knew each other growing up. One of them had been through hell. The other one had really not been. And, his the De Niro character understood that look, 
you know, we can be friends up to a point, but, um, you know, life is life. This is this. You know, when he, he's holding this bullet, he says, look, this is not something else. This is this. And what he meant by that was, you better get your head out of your ass. You better get your shit together. You better, you know, you if you want to be part of this group, you know, like he said, reinforcing the, the identity of the group. If you want to be part of my group, you better have your uh, you better have your shit squared away or there's going to be problems. And I and I think that um, that was a very telling scene, you know, but it's a great movie. Very, very good movie. Right. I'm about to ask a question, which in the era I grew up in was one of the things you were told to never ask someone, which is since you yourself have been in the military, did you have any experiences that you could relate to in this sense? Did you have any I mean, you tell me what you want to say on this topic. Are, are there any things that stick with you? Were, were you? Do you think you were in an era that was treated more kindly? What would you say? Well, you know, I. Well, let me first just say, Thorne, that you know, I, I was, I was, uh, I was never in combat. Uh, I, I was involved in a, a peacekeeping mission at, at one point in Bosnia. I was involved in many deployments overseas, so I, I do have some experience with operational uh, aspects and, and being part of a team. But I, I would never, I would never presume. Right. Understand. Okay. I would never. Yeah, I, I would never take credit or presume to understand what the men who had been in combat had been through. Uh, but I can say that uh, there are some things that I can uh, I can relate to. I think I think being part of a tightly knit group, uh, I can relate to. I, I think the idea of a rules based order is something I can relate to. And I, I, I also believe I can relate to the experience of of. Um, of having lifetime bonds with friends and and fellow comrades who have been through similar stressful experiences that I can relate to because you th- those those bonds um, guys who have been through similar experiences will always have that bond with each other so I I, I can I can connect with that and I, I frankly I do look we've all had you know when I when I first joined and I had to go through the you know, required rituals and required initiation rites. Uh, there were things that I had to straighten out in my person that I I got I got straightened out uh, by others in my own personality because look, we all have immaturities and selfish qualities that need to be kind of uh, stamped out of us. And I had to undergo the same experience myself. I made many mistakes uh, as a young lieutenant. I made many mistakes as um, a young officer uh, when I was out. In the, in the fleet on deployment and uh, believe me you 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 correct yourself very quickly because uh you um you get let's put it this way you get instant feedback <laughs> yes and but i can honestly say that my my mistakes were never were never the result of anything uh, malicious or deliberate it was more just you know not having ever been in that situation before that you know I, I think back now and just some of the leadership mistakes that i made or relating with others uh, you just want to cringe, uh, and you say, "Gosh, how could I have ever thought that way or done that?" But you know, this is—you don't know any better. You know, when you've never been in this situation before, you—you you have to learn by trial and error. And luckily, I had um, uh, situations where nobody was permanently hurt or anything. Um, but uh, yeah, you everybody has to learn. And same thing with you know the the profession that I undertook after that is you know being a lawyer you know when you some of the mistakes i made as a young lawyer you just you, you sit back and you almost want to laugh or cry or say my god how could i have ever handled that that way or done this or done that but you have to be you have to be understand you have to give yourself some some credit you know you um you know you as long as you're trying i, I think people are people are generally forgiving up to a point of mistakes as long as they see that you're sincere and it's not based on malice you know that's would my you, view. Would you say, there's no way to ask this question other than to just ask it. We'll see what you say. Is there a part of you during this time period ever, I, mean, I don't know how else to say it, but almost wanted there to be a war that you were a part of or to see what would happen if you were put in that situation? Is Was there ever any impulse like that within you? Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I would be, I would not be telling you the truth if I uh, said that thoughts like that have not crossed my mind many, many times. You know, I, I felt like, um, you know, I got off active duty in what, 95, 1990, 1995, uh, active service. I never, 
I was never uh, involved in a uh, an actual shooting war. I was never in Iraq. I was never in Afghanistan. So yeah, I have to to be perfectly honest. I do in some ways envy those guys because I felt I was never tested uh, under fire. I was never tested in combat. I was never actually put to the ultimate test. And I think any any uh, young man always in the back of his head is going to want to know. Um, boy, you know, how would I have handled this situation? What, what, what would it have been like? Um, and, uh, maybe someday I will get my chance. Maybe someday I never will. Uh, uh, either way, uh, I'll have to just accept whatever hand of cards that, um, uh, fate has dealt for me. <laughs> you can't wish it. You have to kind of let it happen. You can't, yes. you can't wish for those things too much because then you, then you run afoul of, the anger of the gods. Gone. Sure. Exactly. And I don't want to do that. Yes, it's true. Right. Along these lines, actually, this wasn't a movie that I saw on the list, but you just made me think of it when you were talking about being part of the military. A movie I love is that movie Men of Honor with Cuba Gooding Jr. and Robert De Niro. It was like from the 2000 where Cuba Gooding Jr. is like a guy who's trying to become a some sort of high rank in the Navy being like a diver. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a really yeah, great movie, yeah. but it's one that to me, like the joke is if I was any of the military branches, I would just show this movie on repeat to like school kids. If you want to make them believe that there's anything to be gained from service, this is one of the best movies I've ever seen because it's all about the, the idealized notion of honor and duty and that you're fighting for something bigger than yourself. And also I would say essential within this is why I'm going to ask you about this is the notion that if you behave that way, and you do things in an honorable manner in a meritocratic hierarchy, you will be rewarded. Like other people will look at that and they will make exceptions for you or they will help you or they will stand up for you. Yeah. They will admire the fact that you act with honor. Was it actually your experience of being in the military that that was real? Because sometimes people will cynically say that's just the side they try to sell you to make you get in. But then maybe, you know, like every institution, it's corrupted or people want money or power or whatever else. What Was there, a, was there an underbelly of like actual honor and virtue, do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's true. And and I think what it comes down to is sincerity is everything. Sincerity right. and the desire to be there is everything. And I, I can I can tell you that it happened. I can tell you that it exists because uh, it, it, you know, it happened in, in my own uh, life. You know, I, when I was in college, I was a member of the uh, Reserve Officer Training Corps, the ROTC in college. And um, I, I had a direct experience with this. I, it came about in, th in this way. My freshman year in college, I suffered a collapsed lung, and I was uh, I was disenrolled from the program, much to my uh, frustration and, and despair. And, and, you know, I, I I was hospitalized for about you know two weeks while it, it, it healed, and I was I was immediately medically kicked out of the program because of uh, you know my medical emergency there. But uh, after I was discharged, my um, my Marine officer instructor, we called him the MOI. Uh, who was sort of in charge of us? He he fought for me to get to get me back into the program because he he had seen me uh, in the drills and in the the physical training and he, he he had observed me he had seen me and he felt that I was deserving that I was someone that was worth uh, fighting for even though I had been medically uh, kicked out you know he he was willing to go to the mat for me to help do the paperwork to get me back into the program. Uh, whereas there was another guy uh, a couple years ahead of me uh, who, and I won't give his name, of course, but uh, this guy had uh, let his grades fall. Uh, he had he had ba basically he was a very, very capable guy, but he was kind of a screw off. You know, he let his and, and in those days, you had to keep a certain GPA. You had to keep a certain grade point average. Right. And, and this guy uh, was a partier. Uh, you know, he was he was a good he was a good man. And I think he would have made a good officer, but he didn't have the discipline to kind of knuckle down and uh, kind of bowl the distance. And uh, he let his grades lapse. And this, the, our captain, our MOI, he kicked him out of the program. And in those days, uh, it wasn't like now, you know, where you just kind of go your separate. He, you know, if you were kicked out for for academic reasons for not maintaining your academic standards, you had to go into the fleet as an enlisted man. You were, you had to go in as a he would have had to go to Paris Island as an enlisted man, which probably would have been the best thing for him. But, uh, you know, and he and our captain gave a gave a 
gave a talk to us and he said, you know, look, uh, you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm sending this guy down because he doesn't deserve to be here, but it's, it's guys like, uh, Mr. Thomas here who, who, uh, you know, who, who want to be here, who deserve to be here, uh, who, you know, maybe have uh, a medical issue they need to overcome, but I'd rather have someone like that, uh, who's, who's got the, the tenacity, uh, to, to, uh, to struggle with this and to, who wants to be here than someone who doesn't want to be here. So yeah, they, I, th- I think, I think intention, sincerity and, and desire make all the difference. Absolutely. And I would be the same way too. If I saw some kid who was trying, who maybe, you know, maybe didn't come from a background where he had access to gyms or, you know, he had, he had to struggle maybe with certain aspects. I would fight for that kid because I'd rather have somebody when, when, when the chips are down, I want to have someone whose heart is pure, who's, uh, who's, who's eager, who's, um, who I know is going to, is going to give a hundred, a hundred percent. That's what matters. Right, a movie that I know you have a lot of affection for as well. It's one of my favorite in the war genre has got to be the thin red line. Now, the funny oh, yeah. thing about this is I think the thing that appeals to me so much about it is usually movies are either old school style pulp of like, look, we're good. They're evil. Let hope all our guys make it. Or in the modern day, they're all the post Vietnam war movies of sort of like war is hell. It's cynical. There's nothing good about it. It's just young men dying for no good reason. This movie doesn't do any of that. What, what the incredible thing is it's so philosophical. It's just the yeah. air and the atmosphere about it is so unique. Like I have no military experience myself. So I can't tell if there's anything that relates to sort of the reality of being in the military. But the best way I would describe it is, is like there's something just true about this film, if, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. No, this is a brilliant. Uh, Terrence Malick's, uh, I think this came out in 19, uh, 1997, if I believe. I can't remember. I think so. Yeah. What a brilliant movie that was. You know, and that, that movie really, in many ways, um, like some other war films it, it divided uh viewers and critics there were some that just felt kind of really missed the point and said well it's very unrealistic that's not how things are and and i would say to them well it's not it's not meant to be realistic this is a, a deeply personal these voice the strength of this movie is the voiceovers where yes. you have these very these very intimate characterizations that are portrayed to the viewer through these voiceovers some of which are of, of startling uh, profundity, um, which and, and I think really can't be appreciated uh, except with repeated viewings. Yes, uh, and I I think it's uh, it's a unique war film. Yes, it's 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 set in war. It's it's set on Guadalcanal, but it's uh, it presents to the viewer sentiments and and reflections that would only be really apparent to a participant like long after the fact it's it's like a dream in that in that sense it's meant to be almost a a philosophical dream and i think if you approach it from that perspective i think you can really get a lot out of it but some people just don't have the patience to really sit there and and uh, kind of you know take it take it as a work of art take it for what the director yes. is trying to, to portray just like just like apocalypse now there would be well that's not realistic i mean we don't they never did anything like that <laughs> sure. and you said you said well look that's not the point you you bloody fool they don't they don't they don't that's not meant to be realistic it's meant to be a, it's meant to be surrealistic yes this is a this is a a, a reflective med, it's a meditation on uh, the thin red line is a, a a meditation on i think frankly the meaning of life uh, to to use a very hackneyed phrase but it it really does try to plumb the depths of of man's experience on this earth and what uh what what happens to to men uh under uh, the, the most extreme of pressures some of them some of them fold some of them uh react in one way some of them react in other way i mean there it's 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 just a it's a masterful film and i I don't think we'll ever see anything like it again really 
Yeah, as you're actually just saying that, you're making me think of different scenes. Like when you said about all the voiceovers, I agree, they're incredibly poignant. I mean, when you say that, I'm even remembering the one where it's a guy who's got like a bit of a redneck accent. And so it's a character, especially in modern Hollywood, would be so easy to portray as like, look, it's just some bonehead who never read a book in their life. But when he's talking about like ideas of like his of his fiance left back home or whatever, these are haunting, dude. It's like, they, it gets right into oh. your soul, this shit. Oh yeah. No, the, the most... One of the greatest uh, voiceovers that um, just 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 to show you the the, the power of the, the the screen writing in that movie. This uh, this character you may remember the, the Nick Nolte character, the one who orders uh, Styles. You need to go take that position. I'm ordering you. You better go do that. I'm going to court martial your ass. You need to do this. Remember that that yeah, that yeah. character, this, the screamer. He was a screamer. Now, uh, on the surface of things, you would think that this would be a very unappealing character, a very unsympathetic character, a very sort of, uh, you know, frankly, a horrible character, you, you might you might think. But the way the director, portray, he, he gives him a voiceover where he, he explains why he is the way he is. You know, he, when, when he, he introduces this Nick Nolte character, whose, whose name I can't remember the, the, the character's name, but he says, uh, for years, I've debased myself. For years, I've risen. I've risen up through the ranks i've had to kiss the right asses i've had to, to do so you get a sense that this guy even though he was maybe wrong in his judgment he at least you understand where he's coming from you understand where this guy he, he was a career military man who maybe didn't have many opportunities in life and and he was dealing with a, a situation in the best way he knew how and that really is the tragedy, I think, of war, where you have common men, average men, men from different backgrounds who are put in uncommon situations and are forced to contend with these uh, terrible circumstances that really um, expose their human frailties in all their uh, you know, shocking fragilities. And that, that was a, a lesson I think we, we got from the, the movie Breaker Morant in 1981, which I'm sure you've seen the Australian sure. film, Classic. you know, which again is a brilliant uh, and frankly, the one of the greatest courtroom drama films, war films ever made, you know, explores the same ground. Another movie, this, this one is a bonfire classic. I think a lot of people have seen Heat, the movie that obviously famously oh, had Pacino yeah. and De Niro in. But I always feel like the part that gets so overlooked on this is a lot of people seem to just enjoy the superficial elements. Like, yeah, it's true. The way the gunfights are shot is incredible, even to this day it holds up. It is a very tightly scripted movie. It's got a great cast. But to me, I think the thing that I find most appealing about this movie, I would absolutely rank this as potentially my favorite movie, is I th the actual like two main characters have like almost a, almost themselves a code that they live by, that they yeah. quite clearly explicate. I mean, even the conversations they have with each other are basically explaining sort of like, here's my boundary. And if you go across this boundary, I will fuck you up. And then the other person be like, yeah, I appreciate that, but here's my boundary. And if you come to my boundary, I'll have to destroy you. And essentially there's almost a Shakespearean element to this movie. I thought it's yeah. a fabulous movie though, right? Especially it's got, I think anyone looking for like a masculine figure, this, this movie's got it in spades. Oh God! I mean, what can we say? But he, you know, I, you know, that I, I, I count myself so lucky and so privileged in the sense that I saw that movie in the theaters in uh, when it first came out in '95, and it was just a packed theater, and it, it was just there was such a a hush that fell over the audience just through through a, you know every scene. But uh, yeah, obviously, you know, you know, Michael Michael Mann's. Um, the, the level of research he did on that movie and, and the thoroughness uh, and, and some of those, that, that meeting that you're referring to where the, the Neil Macaulay character is, um, is, uh, you know, meeting with the, the, the Vincent Hanna character yes. that, that really happened uh, in, in real life because these, 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 these figures were loosely based on real figures. Um. So yeah, it's it. There's just so many great lessons in that movie, and just so many great things that uh, that we can get out of it. I mean, just the realism, the the the, the, the thoroughness of everything. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I just it, it just it just bears up under continued, repeated viewings, and um, you know, it's uh, I again I saw it again recently last month, 
And oh, uh, it's a me- it's a mega it's, movie to go back and rewatch. The relationships. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, he just he's juggling so many. The director is juggling so many different things that he just brings together so well. Like these relationships between these uh, the families of the, yes. the, the 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 police and the the the, the, the criminals. Uh, and manages to show them in in a somewhat sympathetic way, and I think he just shows the randomness of fate. You know what what could have been. You know if you know Macaulay could have he could have gotten away scot yeah. free if he had just taken that plane, but he yeah. had to he had to take revenge. And I honestly I I think he got his man. You know re- revenge is is a so <laughs> I mean that's. That's something that uh, maybe Richard the Lionhearted would have done. You know, he, he, <laughs> sure. he, he would have. He would have. Oh, absolutely. So those old, those medieval kings, it would have been worth. It. He said, "Look, even if I have to pay with my life, you sold us out. You betrayed my comrades. You you were responsible for the death of my comrades. So you need to die. You need to you need to pay for what you did." And that, to me, is. Um, uh, frankly, a timeless ethic, and and uh, who who can fail to be moved by that, Lauren? You know, who can fail to be moved by that? Well, along those lines, let me ask you a question then, because maybe this connects to some of your reading of the classics and the moral philosophies of ancient times. Because not only is that exactly a a very famous type of an archetype in theatre literature, the idea of almost like a righteous takedown of someone where it's like in if i mean in the medieval period they would have absolutely said you are essentially you yourself are enacting god's justice by maybe killing this person or ridding yeah. the earth of them or stopping more innocents being harmed right here's the problem i have in life is maybe touching on some of the things we said earlier every single piece of media and sort of person around me would tell me essentially in this analogy no just just get away with the money you know who who cares what that guy anyway he can't reach you anywhere but i have that impulse in myself i have to say quintus i have that thing where if so i mean me and a friend of mine who are journalists in esports we actually literally even use that term we say we always make time for wayne grow because the problem is even though part of me knows (laughs) it can fuck you up and you know there's a price you have to pay yourself that i have to say i know it sounds fucked up but it's not that I don't even know if the revenge is that satisfying, but I would almost be more haunted by not enacting it, if you know what I mean. I almost feel like if people are going to do fucked up things, then their consequence is someone like me might come along and go, you know what, I'm going to hunt you to the ends of the earth, even if I have to die as well. Like, I almost feel like there's almost the truth to that in a way. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to have to add that. I'm going to have to add that phrase to my my own lexicon there. <laughs> Any time for Wayne, bro. I love that. Yeah, exactly. That was, that was exactly what I think, man. I, I think... Look, I, you know, I, I, man, the, the, the older I've gotten, man, I just think that there's, there's certain men that just embrace this uh, chivalrous ethic. And there are certain men that just don't. And either, either it's part of your psyche, either it's part of your soul, or it isn't. I think you can make some headway, you can force some people into it, but some guys just have a, a very, very strong sense of, of moral rectitude. And absolutely, if you sell out and look, he was responsible for the deaths of literally the entire crew. Yes. So he had to suffer. He had to pay. I only wish, uh, you know, I, I only regret that that he hadn't suffered more, frankly, before he had been killed. But uh, no, it was it, it was a very it was a deeply satisfying um, conclusion, and I'm I'm glad that Neil hunted him down and and uh, and paid him back. But uh, this is the life, you know, and, and honestly, it's the perfect ending because, look, he himself was also, uh, you know, he, he, he had em- em- embraced the, the brigand's life. He was a he was a ne'er do well and he, he was also responsible for the deaths of many innocents. So he had to he also had to pay uh, for what he did. So it, it, in many ways, it uh, things perfectly uh, yes. aligned, you know, and. Um, you know, it's and I, I like how it ended with the, the Val Kilmer character, Chris Chaherlis, uh got then this is how it is. Sometimes one man just lives to tell the tale. And I alone survived. <laughs> yes, the tale, exactly. Yeah. As they would say, the, the lay of the last survivor from Beowulf or whatever it was, uh, you know, just some some man, some someone has to has to survive to tell the tale. Yes. 
I mean, a tip of TV fire could bring it all the way back to the Northmen. I know that was an aspect that didn't vibe with some people. They were like, hey, you could have just escaped with that woman, though. And like, and it's like, bro, if you don't get that, this movie wasn't for you. Like that movie, yeah. I'm pretty sure every red-blooded man, when he was having that massive fight at the end where he might die, but he might also get revenge, that is an incredibly satisfying scene. Like in some ways, without spoiling it, I think the end to that movie is perfect, mate. It's, it's, it's a yeah. beautiful dream. Yeah. I've only seen the Northman once. I, I would like to see it again because there there are real great scenes in there of a real compelling visual power that, uh, especially the ending, just the way that it's filmed, it's just very, very, um, I don't know, it had a very uh, sort of a visionary, strange visionary power to it. So uh, I'm going to have to see that again. But, um, you know, yeah, yeah. So it's, those are my thoughts, man. It's all good, right? I saw also that you're actually a, a, a fan of David Mamet, who I also really enjoy a lot of his movies. I find it very well scripted. And the movie yeah. that I saw you picked out, mate, this is always one of my sleepers I have told so many people about. And the ones that watch it always tell me, like, what a great recommendation. It's going to be that movie, The Edge, the one with Anthony Hopkins. Oh, yeah. If people yeah. have never seen this, I don't know how this went under the radar, mate. The cast's amazing. Like, Alec Baldwin's in it, like... This is just, oh, yeah. it's what, this is one of the ultimate men's movies. Like if oh, you're, yeah. if you're a man, you want to reconnect to your dad or the idea of a past God age, this is the movie to watch. Like this is just, to me, this, this is what being a man is. It's about the the harsh reality of what life is and that you can have all sorts of fanciful ideas and contraptions. But at the end of the day, you are going to have to face reality. You're going to have to actually have some skills. You're going to have to battle something if you want to survive. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, I uh, I've loved David Mamet uh, ever since, in 1986, I walked into a theater in Harvard Square in, in Boston, and I saw his uh, his uh, first movie, which was A House of Games. And, and oh, the I, one I've with seen, the guy who's the gambler, right? Yeah, I remember oh, this one. Oh, yeah. I, what I love about his movies, and I, I've seen all of them um, repeated times, uh, what I love is that there's a real moral sense. All of his movies have a very stark uh, moral choice that he gives his characters, and, and they, they really... They really pose very profound moral questions. Some of them are very inscrutable. So, but I, this is what I like, but you know, the edge again, I, I think the, the moral questions in the edge are, you know, this, well, this isn't, there's a number of questions, but then, you know, you've got this, this idea of, uh, you know, people's sincerity, um, you know, this idea of betrayal, uh, survival in, in, in the wild, you know, who, when, when, when a man is really put to the test, is he really, is he really capable of rising to the occasion? And um, I think it also can can just show just how, you know, characters that on the surface may seem to be friendly and well disposed, you know, they may harbor very malicious secrets and uh, intentions. And, um, you know, but the the crucible of struggle brings out everything, doesn't it? And, and, and I think that's what the Anthony Hopkins character uh, discovered. And... Uh, what makes that movie so profound in its ending is where he says, you know, they died saving my life. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, maybe what he means is that their deaths, the deaths of my friends, uh, made, educated me on, on lessons that I needed to learn and, you know, saved me from maybe a life of just, you know, um, you know, meaningless billionaire, um, you know, frivolity. And I, I like to think that was maybe what the, what, what the last line of that movie meant. You know, I'd like to think so anyway. You know, on the line that you just mentioned that, I'd even forgotten the aspect that the main character is supposed to be a billionaire. I almost feel like if you look around the world at the people who are the billionaires and the people we're told have achieved this incredible success, they actually don't at all fit the vibe of a great man of centuries ago. They're not like the Julius Caesar. They're not. In fact, you'll notice they themselves seem to be seeking some sort of an edge or a frontier or something to test themselves. Like clearly just stacking money alone just doesn't f fill the hole in the soul or make you feel like you've you've advanced as a human. It, it's like, it feels like there's there's something about it doesn't quite touch the sides. Like I get the vibe a lot of these, but it's why if you notice a lot of them seem to constantly gamble their whole fortunes over and over again. Like they could all have done the Neil McCauley and just leave and had a chill life just on a, a yacht forever. But there's clearly something about that doesn't really satisfy I get the vibe. What do you think? Well, I, I think, you know, I think what you're, what you're getting at is the, these characters have to make choices 
And, um, you know, those choices have to be based on what their value system is. And I think we would all like to think that when, when we're put to the test, we will make the, the choices that are congruent with proper values and, and uh, you know, moral rectitude and everything. But the truth is nobody really knows. I mean, we, we like to think that we know. We would all like to believe that we'd rise to the occasion and we'd all like to uh, believe that we would, uh, you know, be, do the noble and proper thing. But, you know, uh, I guess the, the, uh, the real beauty of those extreme situations is that that's how you that's the only way you're really going to find out you know it's the only way you're going to find out sure i thought one last movie we could talk about because in some ways it, it ties together a lot of the themes we've discussed and i get the feel in your wheelhouse of movies you like what you like about american culture this just feels like it's the, it's the ultimate answer and it's got to be the movie pattern from 1970 about the obviously legendary oh, yeah. general to me the funny thing about this is i can see what you liked about it because to me it's also what makes like william churchill on the english side so interesting is that he definitely isn't a saint like he had loads of flaws as a person i've no doubt if it wasn't a wartime people would think he was an arsehole he had plenty of things that were negative about him but it's sort of the idea of almost like times call forth the men that are sort of suited to be in that time as it were like if you have a, a massive war situation Patton is exactly not only who you'd want but to me he is just america if you know what i mean yeah no it's a it's such a wonderful movie you know what's great about it again it's I think what made that movie so successful and such a work of uh, genius was that it didn't try to focus on big set piece battles. It it made the movie about Patton the man and yes. not about Patton's tanks or about, uh, you know, battles on Sicily or battles on the Western Front or, you know, uh, it, it was a very human portrayal. And it was... Uh, in, in many ways, like a, a light, like a, one of Plutarch's lives, in the sense that it, it talked about the man. It, it made us, it taught us what made him tick. We know what Patton's uh, weaknesses, his, his, his predilections were, his foibles were, his weaknesses, his strengths, his style of speaking. His, we learn about him. So that we may, so this, and this is what directors so often fail to do is they try to make a movie about the special effects or about, these side issues instead of just concentrating on good old fashioned characterizations and storytelling. And that, but that's what I thought made the movie so, so wonderful. And plus, you know, George C. Scott's just incredible. Oh, it kills it. Yeah. But, do you, um, do you actually think by the way, cause obviously we can only know from historical record. Do you actually get the sense that this is what the great generals of past history were also like, like they had their own incredibly flawed aspects, but then oh, they had absolutely. their own strengths that were obviously incredible on the battlefield, maybe. Absolutely. It's the case. You know, it, I think that point really comes through. If you look at, um, you know, one of the, one of the books that I, the Latin classics that I translated was lives of the great commanders by Cornelius Napos. And, it's a biographical sketches of a number of different military commanders from uh, the ancient world. And, you know, he, it's, it's very clear that these were men that, that had a, um, you know, kind of a mixed bag of, of good virtues and bad virtues. And that, that's really why we love them. That, that what makes them human. No man is a, is a statue of, of perfection. Uh, all men are composites of good and bad. And we can only hope that they're, their positive qualities outweigh their negatives. And um, sometimes that happens uh, and sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes the the dark side got, takes over and can lead to fatal and ruinous consequences. Is there, is there like a great military leader or like a classic piece of literature? Is there something that you think should be made into a movie? What would you pick if you had like the fantasy budget? You could make whatever you wanted. Is there someone that you think like screams out for a great movie? Oh, God. Well, that's great. That's a great question. Yeah, they, uh, yes, I do have an answer for that. Uh, if I had an unlimited budget or if I was, you know, uh, you know, a director and I had the ability to do it, I think that um, – I think that uh, Ernst Junger's uh, Storm of Steel, his memoir okay. of the First World War, should be. I don't think the First World War has ever been given the appropriate realistic treatment that it deserves. I think that that war was so um, so 
disturbing and so shocking in many ways that we've and it, it came before the the modern era which we could sort of uh do justice to these things on in in uh in the cinematic treatment uh plus i think his his memoir is very distinctive in in, in many ways and uh gives a very very uh personalized view of, of his philosophy and i think if it were done it would it would not be easy to do uh but i think it could be done if the right circumstances were were available, so yeah, that would be my vote. That would be my vote. Is do you have like what what director would you want to make that, or is there a an actor you'd want to be in it? Well, I you know I, I haven't really thought much about casting, uh, but you you would have to you would have to make it is if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. You'd have to put the the actors through a boot camp. You'd have to make them live the conditions for around thirty days of being in the trenches. You'd have to. To get that realism, you'd have to have, you'd have to be authentic. You'd have to get real, uh, real people from the area. You'd have to get real Frenchmen, real Germans, real, uh, uh Englishmen and, and put them in these situations. You would have to have period, uh, costumes and, and, and you'd have to do it right. You'd have to do like what, uh, Oliver Stone did for in the movie Platoon when he made his realistic Vietnam War movie. You'd have to, you'd have to do, and I just don't know if anyone is really willing to do that. Uh, you'd, you'd run into commerciality issues, but then again, this is where art conflicts with commercial. Yes. You know, but, um, and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go here pretty soon. That's all good. Yeah. This is going to be the last question. uh, anyway. I, I would love to keep going. Maybe we can continue this next time, but, um, yeah, I, I think, no, I, I've, I've thought, you know, we all have our pet projects and it would be really nice to see someone do that, that, uh, that memoir justice. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the other, the other historical episodes too, you would like to see maybe Cortez's March on Mexico, maybe be given, uh, you know, a realistic treatment. There are just so many heroic episodes in history that have never really been, uh, appropriately, dramatized or if they have been they it's been it's done in, in a way that's very i don't know just uh, detracts from the 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 quality of the the event or the the real lessons of the event in my view so my side channel is very much made possible thanks to my patreon community now this video was kindly supported by raw daughter bo ado mushroom and yurka 86 do you want to choose a topic I focus on next on this channel? Would you like to ask a question for my regular AMA? Do you want teasers to find out which guests are coming on for inquiry next for those long, interesting, but unique interviews? Do you want to take part in an exclusive, never-to-be-released discussion with me privately? Well, heed this call to action and join Thorin's side today via the Patreon link in the description box below.